blame something. We want to blame someone else. Can I share an example with you? As a pastor, I've heard this, and it just it hurts my ears every time I hear uh, these kind of words. But over the years, I've heard different people, and they'll say, well, <clears throat> you know, I, have, I wasn't in church last Sabbath, and the reason was that my boss sat me down, and he or she told me that if I didn't start working on Saturdays on the Sabbath, then I would lose my job. And, uh, or perhaps she might say, well, you know, uh, you know, my boss sat me down and, and my boss told me that if I don't uh, say a certain lie, a certain dishonesty in concern to my business sales, in order to increase my sales, I wouldn't be able to keep my job. And so my boss left me no choice. I had to work on the Sabbath. Okay, do you see where this is going? Okay, now I've heard this more than once over the years, in particular in response to Sabbath, because Sabbath is one of those things where it's harder to hide when we're not at church and say, where were you? We missed you the last couple of weeks. And so the subject comes up. Is that response true? Did the boss leave that particular Christian no choice? Some of you are kind of quiet out there. Some of you are, <laughs> are nodding, okay? Uh, the fact is that uh, that's not true at all, is it? Did the, did the boss leave that employer, Christian, a choice? Sure they did. In fact, it's the actual, the opposite. And so when a Christian comes up and says, well, the reason I'm working on Sabbath now or every second Sabbath or every Sabbath once every month is because my boss left me no choice. It was either that or lose my job. And, uh, and so the opposite is actually the truth, is it not? The opposite is really the truth. Um, what the boss said was that I'm giving you a choice. And you have two or more options. The first option is that you start to work on Sabbath, whatever Sabbath that he wants you to, or you go and find another job. Okay, so there's at least two choices there, isn't there? Now, as it turns out, as I've canceled many of these different individuals as well, and some of them have found and made victorious choices, successful choices, good choices even after they were able to be able to see through their self-justification and that there is choices and they'll make the third choice and they'll say you know what i'm going to pursue this and i'm going to approach my local conference i'm going to approach different religious liberty resources and uh, i'm going to um, uh, approach my employer and let them know that there are legal rights religious liberty rights that protect my employment and protect my right to follow my religious convictions and practices according to the law of the land and according to my conscience. And, uh, and so there's at least three choices as I've had these conversations with different church members. Do you see the difference, friends? And so sometimes we want to declare that there's, I was left without a choice when really there's at least two and sometimes quite often there's three or four different options or choices uh, that we can make in response to that. So I hope that helps as we continue on in this uh, very important subject. Really what we're saying when we're in this kind of situation is that we wish that it were true that we had no choice. Uh, and the reason that we say that, and I speak for myself as well, I'm just as human as you are, I'm in the same condition and struggle as you are, and that is really what we're saying to ourselves is that the right choice is so difficult that I want to pretend and have everybody else confirm to me that I really had no choice. Because it's much easier to make the wrong choice than it is to make the easy choice. You know where I'm coming from here, aren't you, don't you? Why, because we're both the same, aren't we? And, uh, and so yes, I understand, I sympathize with you, I believe that the Lord sympathizes with you that when we're in circumstances like this and we want to declare that we have no choice because the right choice is so hard, God can help you make that right choice. He can help you make that right choice. Will it be easy? No, it won't be easy. I know by personal experience, I've had to make choices, the right choice that is very, very difficult. And, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, I'll be shaking a little bit, you know, if, when I'm doing the right thing because I'm so overwhelmed or nervous by it. But friends, you can make the right choice. God gives you the ability and the strength and the power to make the right choice even sometimes when that choice is difficult. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he had to make the hardest choice in his existence, 
And the Bible tells us that three, it was so hard that three times he fell before his father in that garden in the night. And it tells us that he, the, the choice that he had to make was so hard and it was so overwhelming and it was so difficult that the anxiety that was accompanying his experience caused the little blood corpuscles under his skins to burst and the sweat that was already running down his face was added to by the blood that started to come out of those same pores. Was that a difficult choice? Yes, it was. But when Jesus got up back on his feet and he wiped the blood and the sweat away from his brow, what did he say? He said, not my will, but your will be done. He made the right choice, didn't he? Thank God he made that choice. It was a hard choice, the hardest choice any human being has ever had to make. There's no choice that God puts you in, no circumstances that we can face that is more difficult than the choice that Jesus had to make. So there's our ultimate example, isn't it? There's our ultimate example. Jesus tells us that no matter how, there is nothing that we can face that is that hard, and Jesus tells us we can make it. He modeled it for us. Now, sometimes we develop bad habits. We are, those bad habits can even develop into what we call clinical addictions. Some of us might be facing and dealing with an addiction right now. Okay, I know that between everybody that's in here and everybody that's watching, uh, that there's more than one of us that is dealing with an addiction right now. We have a bad habit that the Lord is speaking to us on. And, uh, and, and such. So either a bad habit or an outright clinical addiction. Now sometimes when we're found in a, in, a, in a very ingrained bad habit or an addiction, it can seem to leave us without a choice in the matter. It controls us. Our mind is telling us one thing and our, our hands are doing another thing, aren't they? Okay? And, uh, and so uh, addictions can be so compelling, so powerful, that it can seem and it can even convince us that it is beyond our power, that we have no choice in the matter but to continue to practice that particular addiction. Drug addictions, all kinds of other addictions, of course, that are existing today. Is that true? Is it true that it's, they have no choice in the matter? No, of course. I also know that there's some in this room or some that are watching here that are previous alcoholics. They're ex-alcoholics. They're ex-drug addicts. There's all kinds of people that are victorious and haven't been involved in their particular addiction of the past for years. And so we know that it's not true. We know that an addiction is not something that cannot be overcome. We know that it is not something that is out of our control. Uh, there are too many people existing today that can tell us otherwise. And so not ultimately, it's not beyond our choice. All of us are given two very important powers. Number one, we have the power to surrender our hearts and our lives to Christ. We have that power. It's not by coincidence that the success of Alcoholics Anonymous has one of those key elements, which is that you need to be able to surrender yourself to the higher power called God. You need to be able to look beyond yourself to something that's bigger and more powerful than you. Okay, so this is, this is critical. We have that choice to be able to surrender ourselves to God. And then we also are called to seek upon God-given resources that God gives to us. In America, we are blessed with hundreds and hundreds of detox centers that are across America. And those detox centers have some of the, there's some of us here watching that have, that have looked to those and experienced those as a critical key in overcoming that particular addiction in our life. And so detox centers are God-given therapists, help and support groups that are organized by different organizations and many of them are led by ex-addicts that have been addicted to the very same thing that you may be addicted to today. Intercessory prayer by believers, requesting other believers, please pray for me. I need to overcome this particular bad habit or addiction in my life. These are God-given resources, accountability partners, 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and there's all kinds of, there's a plethora of different organizations that are out there that we can use that are God-given resources to work in cooperation with a heart that is surrendered to God. And when you put those two different ingredients together, you too can count yourself an ex-addict. Do you believe that, friends? Everybody's pretty quiet out there this morning. 
This is golden stuff, is it not? This is golden truth that God has given to us that we might understand that there is no reason, there is nothing in this world, there is no circumstance, there is no devil, there is no sinful nature that, can, that cannot be overcome without those two, with those two resources. God-given resources here on earth and support and a heart that surrendered to God and looking to him for strength. I heard a couple of amens out there. I'm glad that, that I'm not alone here this morning. And so that brings us back to our memory text. The only way that we can find ultimate success in making good choices is by making the most important choice that anybody can possibly make. Choose whom you will serve this day. And so there we have this key verse, uh, the key word, which is choose. And then that choice must be repeated on a daily basis. As we join hands with Joshua and with Joshua's family, because he says, as for me and my house. Now, house in Bible terms, in Bible writers' minds, in this context, and over and over throughout the Bible, always represents your family. He's not talking about the physical structure, whether it's a four-bedroom house or a three-bedroom. He's not talking about that. He's talking about his family. He's talking about the people in the house. And so Joshua is saying, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And the most successful, loving families on the planet have made that critical choice. Has your family made that choice? Have you, as the head of that family, made that choice? These are important questions for us to ask because this is the key and the bedrock of having a successful and loving family. And it has to be repeated on a daily basis. It's not a one-time choice. Sometimes we as Christians have made the mistake of believing that if we come to an altar call one day when the, when the Lord is speaking to us in a genuine way and we genuinely give our hearts to the Lord and then we just kind of go on with life after the days that follow. No, that altar call and that surrender and that time that you're found on your knees, giving your heart to the Lord needs to repeat, be repeated on a daily basis. Every single morning, you need to repeat that altar call experience. Every single morning you have to kneel down before the Lord and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Today I die to myself and I want you on the throne. The throne of my heart, the throne of my life. Now I'm not making this up. Of course, the Apostle Paul, for many of us, have read these different verses. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 31. Paul makes these three, gives these three powerful words. He says, I die daily, as many of you know that scripture already. It's a daily experience and a daily choice. In other words, Paul is saying, every day that begins, I begin with the decision to die, to die to myself. He unpacks that a little bit further in Galatians chapter two and verse 20, when he declared, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a longer version of I die daily. Well, I'm thankful to know that the Bible teaches that there is not a single person or family who can't make that saving choice. Do you believe that, friends? Now, unfortunately, there are some very large Christian circles and traditions that uh, have tried to convince us that God determines even before we're born whether we're saved or lost. That he pre predestines us outside of our choice, outside of our free will, and no matter what we do, no matter how much we desire, might desire to make a saving choice, we will be lost when it's all said and done. But friends, I categorically reject that particular teaching. Why? Because I find that the Bible says different over and over and over again throughout the Bible. Now we have some volunteers that are going to be uh, uh, reading for us here and Haftis is going to read the first scripture it looks like this morning and that is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. Thank you. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world. Okay, now I have to confess, the first time I read that verse, I had to go straight to my dictionary on my shelf and look up that word, propitiation. And maybe you're one of those as well, and you're saying, you know, what in the world? I've never used that word in my life. And uh, typically, we don't use that in our day-to-day -day conversation. And so when I looked it up, it basically said, in a nutshell, you know, winning the forgiveness of or winning the covering of. 
And, and so, of course, here we find that the Bible is declaring that Jesus is the winner of the forgiveness, not only of us. Now, of course, he's speaking to the Christian church when he's writing that letter. So the us is you and me, the Christian church, but not only for us only, but also for the whole world, it says, doesn't it? Okay, so how many did Jesus die for? Everybody. Jesus wants everybody in heaven. He has predestined every single human being for eternity, for heaven. But then he leaves us free choice of whether we want to accept that predestination. And, uh, and so this is really what the Bible teaches. And so the ultimate key is not the false belief of whether you have been predestined by God to be saved or lost regardless of your good choices that you desire to make, but whether or not you are going to respond to his knocking on your heart. Because not only does the Bible tell us that Jesus died for, you on your, uh, for your sins on the cross, but then in addition to that, ever since he is resurrected to the glory, the Bible says that he's knocking at our hearts. He's knocking at our hearts. One of my favorite verses, Revelation chapter three and verse 20. Behold, Jesus says, this is in red letters if you're in Revelation three, verse 20. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone opens the door and invites me and I will come into him and he, and I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Isn't that a beautiful text? And so the knocking takes place on every single person's heart. But Jesus never reaches down to the doorknob. That's why we have some of these beautiful artistic renditions, you know, where we have pictures of Jesus and he'll be uh, pictured there knocking on the door. But quite often, if not all the time, you'll see that the artists the, in the, have the insight to understand that Jesus will never open the door. And so it's a one doorknob uh, door. In other words, the outside of the door where Jesus is knocking on, if you look carefully, almost I think everyone I've ever seen doesn't have a doorknob there. The only doorknob on that door is on the inside. And that's where you are, aren't you? And so if we reach down and turn the doorknob and open the door, then he'll come in. So Jesus never opens the door. He never kicks the door open. As Christian traditions and history is full of Christians that believe that we need to kick the door down. And we need to be able to force people, compel them to follow Jesus. Is that possible? No, on the outside you might get some success, but not on the inside. And so, no, I don't recommend it, neither does Jesus. And so, uh, making that ultimate choice is how we will respond to the knocking of Jesus on the door of our hearts. Well, let's turn to our next scripture. And we have another volunteer that is going to be reading Matthew chapter 22 and uh, verse 37. Thank you, Dan. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Okay, thank you. This is the greatest commandment of all the Bible, Jesus tells us, by the way. To love the Lord your God with all your strength, your heart, and your soul, and your mind. And in different times, he, there's different aspects of our being that it it includes, but the point is that we love Jesus with everything. Now, the only way that we can truly live, live out the command is, is, is to have the free will to choose not to love. Have you ever thought about that? The only way that we can live out the command is have the free will and the choice, therefore, to not love. In other words, if I don't have the free will and choice to not love, I cannot truly love. Why? Because love requires free will. And that's why free will is most valuable to God above all things. He creates us for, with free will and he will never take that free will away from us. And by the way, that's why so much horrible things happen in this life because that's part of the cost of keeping that until judgment day comes, is that free will. If I don't have the choice not to love, I can't truly love. Why? Because then otherwise we're just robots. Okay, can you create a robot that tells you they love you every day? Okay, you can, you, I think you can get robots that will vacuum your room and, and, uh, and make you breakfast in the morning, maybe if, you know, we're approaching that, aren't we? Um, and these are all loving things that they can do for us, but they do they truly love us? No, because they don't have the choice not to love us. They're programmed only to say, I love you. They never have the choice to say, I don't love you. And so in order for us to be above robots, God has to give us free will, the choice not to love. 
All right, let, let's move to Monday because we're running out of time quickly. What does the Bible say on how we can make the right choices? Well, number one, we need to pray. How often should we pray? We need to pray without ceasing as the uh, scripture is quoted in the uh, as quarterly study. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says pray without ceasing. And so we need to have a prayer of full life. We need to pray on a regular basis. We need to be able to stay close to God. Keep talking to God about the life and the circumstances in which we live. We need to remember to ask God for wisdom. God gives us a certain amount of inher inherent wisdom and, and, and such, but if we ask for wisdom, we can receive so much more. James chapter one, verse five says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. Does God counsel us to ask him for wisdom? Sure he does. Do we need wisdom to make good choices? Sure we do, okay? So we need to pray, and in the midst of that prayer, and part of that prayer, we need to ask God, please give me the wisdom that I need for today's choices and decisions. Well, how else can we make good choices? Well, we have a volunteer that's going to read 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 for us this morning. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, thank you. So this is a powerful summary of what the Bible actually tells us about itself. And we need to look to the Bible uh, to make choices that are in harmony with its teachings, with the principles that it reveals. Sometimes it corrects us and helps us to make better choices and, uh, and it also uh, instructs us in righteousness and tells us what those good choices are. And so are the choices that I'm making, are the decisions that are before me in harmony with the teachings, with the principles, with the law of God? This is an important question for us to ask to make good choices. Then Proverbs chapter three and verses five and six. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. All, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And so God here is telling us that we need to continually keep God in it. Always have God involved. Always have God involved. Invite God to every decision, every choice that you're making throughout the day. Lean not on your own understanding. Then in Proverbs chapter 24, verse six, it says, for by wise counsel, you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. And so this is one that I believe that has been undervalued by many of us too often. And, um, and, uh, and of course, uh, we always have to remember that when we do choose to seek counsel from under other human beings, we have to consider the source. This is very important. So not only is it important to follow the counsel and remember that there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors, one of the God-given resources God gives to us is other human beings to help us make good choices, to find that wisdom. But we need to ask ourselves, is the person that we're talking to connected with the Lord himself or herself? Is that important? Sure it is, isn't it? Okay, so we have to make sure that the, the counselors that we're choosing um, are connected to the Lord. Do they serve and worship God? Have they demonstrated wisdom in their own lives? If you ask a fool for counsel, is that gonna help much? It's not gonna help much, is it? In fact, it, may think, it will probably make things worse. So you wanna make sure that you're observing that person and saying, okay, this person uh, seems to give evidence uh, that they're connected to the Lord and they've demonstrated that they have wisdom in their own life as well. Particularly if you're making a big decision in a particular area, um, it's much more helpful if you choose counselors that have already demonstrated success in that area. So if you're looking for a good education and you're wondering what decision should I make in concern to my education, it's probably a good idea to talk to somebody that's already succeeded in, in the educational world and uh, in their life experience. And so I think that's helpful. And, uh, and so seek counsels, counselors here on earth. Well, Tuesday then goes on and says, well, how do we apply the principles in the Bible in order to make good friends? Is choosing our friends important? Mm-hmm. Or should we just kind of make friends with anybody that's friendly? Too often, I believe, I fear, that we underestimate the power of friends to influence us for good or for evil. Um, God has told us that we shouldn't make friends with anybody that's friendly. 
Okay, being friendly is important, isn't it? Okay, it's no fun being friends with somebody that's not friendly. There's an old saying, and it says this, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Some of you heard that saying. Show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Now that reflects a very real solid Bible teaching. It's probably a Christian that came up with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. The apostle Paul was inspired to write this. He says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And so the friends that we rub shoulders with makes a real difference in concern to our spiritual success, our moral success. Uh, it can be in regards to our uh, work success, careers, all kinds of different areas. And so it's not by coincidence that the Bible tells us to choose our friends very carefully. And so again, we have a volunteer that's gonna read for us Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 26. Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. All right, so the second half, of course, reflects what we just read from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and then in response to that very real law of life, it tells us that we should choose our friends carefully. And, uh, and so again, just because somebody is friendly doesn't mean that they're destined or it's wise to be their friend. And, uh, and sometimes we can find ourselves slipping into friendships that we begin to realize are not good. And I can tell you by personal experience, it's hard to get out of those friendships later on. It's much harder. And I made that mistake. Denise and I made that mistake. We were going through some of our college years and we kind of got connected up with a friendly group that we connected with in a very well way. They had a good sense of humor in the same way we did and we enjoyed each other's company. We had a lot of good times. But it didn't take long as we continued down that road with them that we realized that even though they were professed Christians, they weren't all that committed to following Christ. And, uh, and some of the attitudes that they started to reveal weren't really in line with the principles of Christ. And some of those attitudes were a little bit uh, scornful or mockful even of, of, of being committed to leading a biblical life. And so this was already couple of years down the road and so Denise and I you know, one of the most difficult things we ever did in our lives was that one day we woke up and the Lord had convicted us so hard we said we need to we need to get out of this circle we have to get out of this circle and so we did and uh, it was difficult we had to go for long walks just to debrief and kind of keep confirming that the decision we're making is right and uh, I, I know in my heart of hearts that I made the right decision that I made that right decision and the fruits later in, the, in, in a couple of those, at least a couple of those people's lives started to reveal themselves and they're not in the church anymore. They're not following Christ according to the Bible anymore. And uh, so I'm thankful that we made that decision even though it was a little late. You know, there's another saying, it's best to stop the train before it gets out of the station. And it's a lot harder once that train starts to gain its momentum to be able to turn things around. Um, so let's follow the Bible. That's why I'm glad I can share with you here from the Bible and also that you might not be able to make that same mistake and have to go through that difficult experience. Now all this being said, we also must not look for perfection in our friends. If you're looking for a perfect friend, you're gonna be looking for a long time. Okay, there's a saying that I like, I saw it on a little, I don't know, a bumper sticker or somebody had another mirror in their bathroom, I was busy or something, and it says a friend is someone who knows all about you but likes you anyway. Isn't that the truth? Okay. Anybody here have a perfect friend? Anybody here perfect? <laughs> okay, let's go to the, uh, the lesson study. Uh, Wednesday. Uh, uh, no, sorry, Tuesday. Tuesday, page 17. I want to share with you a really powerful quote. Now, this is golden, so please listen carefully if you've been distracted here and wandering off in your mind. This is from uh, Ellen White, and it's from... Uh, powerful book entitled Pastoral Ministry, page 95. It says this, even the best of us have these unlovely traits. And in selecting friends, we should choose those who will not be driven away from us when they learn that we are not perfect. Mutual forbearance is called for. What does mutual forbearance mean? Mutual forbearance. Mutual means both ways, okay? Forbearance means long-suffering, you know, able to forbear 
different unlovely or not likable traits, okay? Faults in your character, okay? Mutual forbearance is called for. We should love and respect one another, notwithstanding the faults and imperfections that we cannot help seeing. For this is the spirit of Christ. Humility and self-distrust should be cultivated and a patient tenderness with the faults of others. This will kill out all narrowing selfishness and make us large-hearted and generous. I don't know about you, but I want to be large-hearted and generous, don't you? So this is golden counsel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on my wall somewhere, maybe in my office. You know, this, is, this summarizes, you know, a friend is somebody who knows all about you but likes you anyway. And so the Bible points us to a text, and I don't have it printed out here. Let's go to it quickly. It's uh, Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17. Proverbs 17 and verse 17 summarizes what we just read from uh, Ellen White in that old saying as well. Uh, Proverbs 17 and verse 17. Okay, verse 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And, uh, and so basically what that's saying is, a true friend is not a fair-weather friend. Okay, a fair-weather friend means that they're only friends with you when it, the weather is fair. But as soon as the storms of life come along, well, you know, I've got an appointment, I'm busy, I'm not going to be able to be around. Okay? And so uh, God calls us not to choose fair-weather friends, and he also calls us not to be fair-weather friends. And that kind of also reflects what we just read in the Council of, of Pastoral Ministry as well. Well, let's talk a little bit before we close here. The last few minutes that we have, I want to look at Wednesday's lesson. And this, of course, is, is an extension in a large way of what we read and learned on how to make good choices as well as how to choose friends. And, uh, and so when we go to Wednesday, I just want to read the first sentence to start off. Wednesday's lesson study, it says, if we're supposed to choose friends carefully, you must even be more careful when it comes to choosing your future spouse. Do you believe that? I hope you do, and if you don't, I hope that you do by the end of this study because this is really, really important. Um, yeah, one of the most important questions that a couple can ask themselves when they're considering marriage is this, and I'm starting to integrate this for the first time in my pre-marriage counseling sessions. And, and it, it, do you count your boyfriend your best friend? Do you count your girlfriend your best friend? And as you're considering marriage with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, are you seeing yourselves of having the potential and the commitment to be best friends for the rest of your life? Because that's really what it means to be together, to be one for life until death do you part. God has called your husband, ladies, to be your best friend. Now some of you are going, he's not a perfect friend, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and husbands, God has called you, your, you to call your wife and see your wife as your best friend. God has called, the, you know, the most beautiful, most successful marriages is when a man and a woman looks at each other as lifetime companions. Companions. She's got her close friends, She's got her social life, and I've got mine. Now, we don't want any of this in our marriages, do we? Okay, we don't want to have this kind of, and, and too many couples have made this mistake. I've got my close friends and my social life. He's got his close friends. He's got his football buddies. I've got my coffee club buddies, and, and, and we have our own social life. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have friends. Guys, you know, husbands can have guy friends, you know, and, and hang out with them more than, uh, you know, but that, that shouldn't be the, the rule. That shouldn't be the, the main practice. The main practice and the most time that you be, should be spending with is your best friend, which is your husband. And if your husband is not your best friend, then you have a choice to make. You can choose to make your husband your best friend from this day forward. Do you believe that? It's true. And same with the husbands. If your wife is not your best friend, you can choose to make your wife your best friend from this day forward. You can choose that. God gives you that power. God is calling you to do that if you're not doing it today. God has not called you just to kind of have romantic moments with my wife or my, my husband, and then otherwise I have my social circle over here separate. No. If you're going to go out, then let me talk to my wife, and I'll see if she is interested if you invite me out. Why? Because we come as a unit. We come together. We're a team. 
We're companions. We're each other's best friend. And, uh, and so I think it's important for us to understand that principle. Well, that being said, all the steps, as I said earlier, uh, the counsel that we learned on how to make good choices, how to find good friends, is definitely applied to choosing a spouse. I want to share with you another quote, and this comes from a book called Adventist Home, and uh, it's page uh, 71. It says this, if men and women are in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate marriage, they should pray four times a day when such a step is anticipated. Now, what's four divided by two? It's two, isn't it? In other words, she's saying you should be praying twice as often and twice as much if you're anticipating marriage than before if, uh, the, than the, mer- the prayer life you have. Pray without ceasing. If you're going to make a good decision concerning your friends, you need to pray without ceasing. And so you need to pray four times a day. Marriage is something, she goes on, marriage is something that will influence and affect your life both in this world and in the world to come. And this brings us to another mistake that hurts the heart of myself and so many pastors across this land. And that is there's too many Christians today that are making and choosing spouses that are not fully committed to Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I am here representing the Lord, friends. And he is telling you that that is an absolute large, one of the worst stupid mistakes that you can make in your life. Don't do it. The biggest mistake that you can make is to choose somebody that is not fully committed to Christ. Period. The spiritual fatality rate of believers who make this mistake is is super high. It's way higher than the success rate of those who remain faithful to Christ. And so friends, one of the most dangerous things you can do is to marry somebody that's not fully committed to Christ. Now, I'm not just making this up on my own. Some of you know the scriptures, don't you? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, what does it say? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, 14, it says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Do you believe that, friends? I'm speaking the truth here this morning. Friends, God is speaking to you. If you haven't chosen a spouse yet, spouse yet or you're seriously considered choosing a spouse that is not fully committed to Christ, Jesus is telling you, don't do it. Don't make that choice. I fear that when we make this mistake, in fact, I don't just fear, I'm convinced that when we make this mistake, we not only endanger our faith and our salvation, but we reveal that we don't fully trust that God has the right person for us in our future. We're saying, Lord, I have no choice. Here we go back to it again. I have no choice. If I don't choose this one, I'm going to be left alone for the rest of my life. Friends, that is not true. God's word has just told you that that person is not the one for you. And if that person is not the one for you, you need to trust him. You need to understand that as hard as it might be to separate your heart from somebody that you've become affectionate with, that God has somebody that is right for you, that loves the Lord as much as you do that will pray with you every morning, that will pray with you every night, that will, in, will involve themselves and want to be involved in your family worship, that will lead your family out the door every Sabbath morning to go to church rather than stay home and watch the football game and say, honey, why are you going to church again? God has called us to equally yoke ourselves with believers only. Well, I'm out of time, and I started preaching there a little bit, didn't I? I forgot it was Sabbath school. You don't have to forgive me. Well, our closing note, of course, and the quarterly points this out very wisely. It says, not only do we have to make sure we choose the right person for marriage, but we be the right person for marriage as, as well. Jesus says, why are you trying to take that speck out of your brother's eye while you have this big plank sticking out of your own eye? Make sure that you have the plank taken out of your own eye before you get too choosy in choosing the right spice. Well, we're out of time here today. I'm thankful that you have uh, endured my preaching, and uh, I pray that God has spoken to you in any way that you may need here this morning. And we look forward to having you join us again next week as we continue to study in this very important subject of family. God bless you, and we will see you next week.
Okay, so that's the end of our Sabbath school study, and we invite our deacons as we find them faithfully coming forward, and they're going to give us opportunity, if we don't give during our regular offering at worship, to be able to offer to our international missionary projects around the world, and before we do that, we're going to pray. Father in heaven, before we take our intermission, we want to pray, God, that you will bless this offering. Um, God, we want to thank you so much for the word that you have given to us. I want to thank you so much for the truths these precious practical and spiritual truths that you've given to us in concern to making good choices. Excuse me, and to overcome the bad choices that we find in our life as well. God, please bless us. Help us to make good choices, Lord. And for all ways in which we have failed you, all which ways we have failed to pray on a regular basis and ask for wisdom and talk to you and submit to your counsels, even though they may not always be in line with our own desires to know that you know what is best for us and that you always have our best interest in mind. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen.
place, and we're going to begin our worship service with some singing. Uh, and what better topic to sing about than than praise to Jesus? You know, Jesus does many things for us. Uh, this first song we're going to sing is number 520, He Hideth My Soul. And uh, Jesus looks after our, our soul. He envelops us. He... Uh, hides our life in the depths of his love. His love is so complete and full that it can cover us and comfort us. And that's what this song is about. We're going to sing all four verses of number 520, He Hideth My Soul. Please sing with me. 